good evening. Um, I have for about 20 years been practicing as a student and as a uh, now professor uh, a very old method of pedagogy called the Socratic method, which I learned in college in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, and now put into practice in my own classrooms. Uh, central to the Socratic method is the ability, it's a rather elusive ability, but it's the ability to ask the right question to begin a discussion. Um, when I was a freshman, uh, my, myself and my friends were all full of great ideas, uh, ended up in Annapolis, and we thought we knew, of course, uh, as freshmen often do, uh, all the answers before the questions were even asked, uh, until we were all flattened uh, the very first night of freshman seminar by the venerable Joseph Winfrey Smith, uh, who had been in St. John's for 40 years, ever since the 19, um, oh good Lord, uh, long before I was even a concept in my parents. Um, he came up with the question very first night out, what is the will of Zeus from uh, the first five books of Homer's Iliad. Of course, we had no way of answering this, and we looked rather pathetic at the end of the evening. Um, uh, asking Socratic questions to students is, is very interesting and a lot of fun, but sometimes uh, we as professors are, how should we say, rewarded at times when we get asked very good questions as well. Uh, there was one evening, I believe um, hmm, a couple of months ago, um, last semester, where I uh, received a particularly interesting question from a former student of mine who asked after a very long Western civilization class with which we studied, good Lord, Hammurabi's code, all the way to Alexander the Great and the fall of the Roman Republic, uh, I was asked the question, um, you know, Prof, uh, how did Rome become Italy? I, Head scratcher that one. I thought, what, what, what kind of a question is this? Obviously, we know the tracing of the history. We can go to the Renaissance, Machiavelli, and eventually we end up with the feudal kingdoms. Uh, but that's not what he was asking, ironically. Uh, the point he was trying to stress, strange one, was that when you think about it, when we think of Rome, what do we think of? We think of the iron-sandaled legionaries conquering half the world. Uh, we think of turgid, powerful chariots, and aboard them soldiers all saying, Ave Caesar. We go from the Ave Caesar to the Maserati in South Beach and the Chow Baby. Uh, it's a very strange transition. Uh, with that in mind, I began to ask the question, if that is such a transition from Rome to Italy, could we apply that, maybe soberingly so, but could we apply it to how did Athens and Sparta become Greece, specifically Greece today? Um, uh, during the uh, seminars, I hope to see hope, uh, many of you there in the seminars, you'll notice uh, I'm, I'm the one person probably who's not an economist during the seminars, I teach philosophy uh, um, and history. Um, I'll be centering on the study of freedom and liberty uh, during uh, the seminars. And central to this is the Greek idea that prior to Greece, really, we don't have this concept of what it means for an individual to be free. Uh, there are many ancient cultures, obviously, before Greece, yes? We have uh, Assyrians, we have Hittites, we have Egyptians, Minoans. And Minoans, of course, are proto-Greeks. But we don't have a clearly defined idea of what it means to have liberty. Now, why I think that's strange, considering Greece today, uh, is that Greece today points, uh, how should I say, paints a rather sobering picture of what a country looks like when it's beginning to, um, for lack of a better word or verb, unravel. Um, we look at Greece today, and we notice it is um, $413 billion in debt. It has a debt larger than its GDP, um, with the possibility of perhaps never repaying that debt. Uh, more curiously, when you think of how um, much that's hurting the Greek economy, we have now civil strife. Um, the idea of strife, by the way, is a very Greek idea. Thucydides, the um, great historian, would point out that strife is not really war. It's not an army going up against another. It's not the Greeks going against Persia. Uh, Leonidas and his brave 300 and all those great abs you see in the movie. Uh, <laughs> more often than not, uh, strife and struggle happens within a community itself. What does it mean when a country that taught us, or a group of nation states, that taught us the value of fighting for one's liberty from the subjugation of Persia, is now having struggles on the streets, riots on the streets with 60,000 people. Ironically, uh, those 60,000 people include media men who decide, you know what, the heck with it, I'm going to join the rally. You know, it might be more fun than covering the rally uh, or demonstration. Uh, we also have policemen, ironically, uniformed policemen and uh, Coast Guard and fire, uh, fire personnel joining the demonstrations themselves. Uh, one has to ask, uh, with, with all these people obviously preoccupied, uh, what's to stop the thriving thievery business, I, I guess, in Athens? Um, one has to wonder, why, what is happening to this country, which, if you guys are looking at the um, economic news today, yes, uh, the uh, Dow 
plunged even further than it has for about a week upon fears of what's happening in Europe, uh, fed, of course, by Greece. Um, when one examines what's happening to Greece, one has to ask the question, does freedom lead to this, since the Greeks, of course, contributed this notion of freedom to us? Um, Aristotle, of course, is a Greek philosopher who I, I hope many of you will meet later on in your uh, academic careers. Aristotle is a student of a guy called Plato, who himself was a student of a guy called Socrates, who I deal a lot with uh, in the seminars in the summer. Socrates, you perhaps have heard of him before if you've watched Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Socrates. Uh, anyway, he's a very fascinating person, by the way. Anyway, uh, Aristotle, of course, is, when you think about it, the grandson, um, intellectually, uh, of Socrates, passing through Plato. Um, Aristotle will say, when you found a city, specifically if you try to build an ideal city, you have to bear in mind that the ideal city must lie between extremes. Aristotle is very much, how should we say, the Goldilocks of philosophy, i.e., you don't want something too hot or too cold. You want something just right. What does he mean by this? Aristotle will say if you build a city too small, the obvious drawback is uh, you'll be conquered every single time. Uh, you, you have no means of defending yourself. If you build a city too large, you have no means and no wherewithal to manage yourself. You quickly implode upon yourself because you're too heavy, too ponderous, too unmanageable. The trick is to build a civilization that fits a golden mean, much like Aristotle's moral philosophy, well, which I can get into perhaps a little bit later on if we have extra time. Um, the idea being is that when you build a state, you have to be very careful not to err on making it too powerful and too large and also rather too small and too feeble to protect itself. Uh, recent statistic out of Greece today, apparently one third of the Greek economy is um, uh, run exact, uh, mostly by the government. It's essentially, uh, it takes up one third of its whole economy. Perhaps Aristotle's warning of getting a little bit too large uh, in that sense, of not being able to somehow uh, branch out and provide many different forms of livelihood for its people. However, Aristotle will go one step further and say, after you figure out the right size of a city, you have to make sure there are six given requirements of how to make the city most effective, and most ideal. Number one, obviously you have to have food. A city needs to be self-sustaining. This is one of the ground, um, how should we say, one of the um, seeds of the ideal liberty, of the idea that we trade not because we have to, but because we want to. We can sustain ourselves otherwise. After food, you need arts. I always stress to my uh, students at Academy of Art University, this does not mean painting and sculpting uh, or, or creating new video games like Bayonetta. Uh, it, it's rather the arts are vocations and fields of, um, of work that you can have a diversification of the economy. Uh, you also need arms. Ironically, something the Founding Fathers knew very well in the history of this country. Uh, perhaps one of the last true defenders of liberty is an armed population. Um, the fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, following an order a state or a city needs to have funds, needs to be able to sustain itself. The sixth, I'll jump further really quickly, uh, the sixth and last is a state needs to have courts. But it's the fifth requirement that perhaps has the most bearing uh, with regards to uh, what's happening to Greece today. Aristotle will say the fifth requirement, which he calls the chief of all requirements, ironically, is the care and service of the gods. Now, obviously, Aristotle is a pre-Christian. Yes, he is a pagan, uh, gods plural, uh, in Greek society. The question then would be, why would Aristotle place the care and service of the gods as chief? It's one of six, obviously, but why would it be the most important? Aristotle would stress, there are only so many things that a city can do to keep its people in line. In a sense, if you need to teach people the parameters of their own behavior, uh, you're almost failing by definition. The people should know by themselves where limits are. Uh, the great Greek scholar Edith uh, Hamilton will say, uh, American Greek scholar, uh, will say that what makes Greece and Greek freedom very unique is that Greek freedom is limited freedom. It is the ability, somehow, for the individual without coercion to say when enough is enough, when enough is just right and not going any further. Aristotle will say it is very difficult for any society to have this, uh, to have this sort of control, uh, this moderation, the Greeks will call it sophrosune, this ability to moderate oneself. It's very, very difficult to have without some sort of, um, how should we say, influence of the transcendental, something beyond simple human life. Now, this being said, 
when we look at Greek society today uh, and the strife happening uh, in uh, the streets of Athens, uh, we notice that the policemen are joining these demonstrations. We notice, of course, that the other two-thirds of the Greek economy are entirely tied to tourism. Um, simple question, of course, if you're a tourist and uh, you're trying to evade that big cloud of fo volcanic ash over Iceland, uh, and you somehow fulfill your lifelong wish to go to Greece, which I hope one day to do, and to go to Thermopylae, pay respect to Leonidas, and maybe do some crunches to match him. Um, <laughs> how exactly are we encouraged to spend our tourist dollars when, frankly, policemen and soldiers are running around on the streets demanding for better paying jobs? It's an interesting conundrum to think about it. I am demanding, I am destroying things in order to get higher employment. Um, or anyway, uh, very, very strange. The Greeks, of course, were masses of irony. Perhaps it's a modern manifestation of it. Um, when one looks at the situation, one is struck by something most stark um, in this perspective, and that is the riots happening in Greece, ironically, are not riots against the old economic system saying, hey, come on, guys the things you did for the past 20, 30 years got us into this mess. No, they're not riots complaining about the way uh, things have been done which have led to the suffering currently happening in Greece. If you listen to, to the language within the riots, the riots are complaining that things now are being cut off, i.e. no longer massive spending for government programs, uh, very high taxes, less and less public money going into people's private pockets. But again, there's double irony here. The riots are not saying, free us from this economic system which has done no good, but are rather saying, give us more of it. Uh, again, going back to the central question I began uh, this, this talk with, um, if I could detail the transition and perhaps um, journey from Athens and Sparta to Greece, like we have um, from Rome to Italy, there's one word that perhaps is most poignant and most um, usable at this moment, and that word is a very classically Greek art form, and a media form the Greeks will, of course, uh, make very famous, uh, and that art form and medium uh, in Greek is called tragedos, <coughs> tragedy. Classical definition of tragedy, of course, is not a sad story necessarily, it's a story of a fall, beginning at a high point and ending up low. The opposite, of course, is a comedy, which is not necessarily a funny uh, story if you've read Dante, it's not very funny unless you play the video game, which is rather interesting. Uh, <laughs> but it's a story of a, uh, a previously elevated position now being lowered. Uh, and one has to ask the question, oh, why is this the case? And perhaps what can we do to avoid this? Uh, I'll leave you with a, a quote. Um, there is a, an archaic Greek poet called Facilides who will come long before Thermopylae, around the mid 500s. Facilides uh, will say, a city in good order though small and built on a distant crag, is mightier than foolish Nineveh. Nineveh, of course, was the capital city of the Assyrians, who were the world's great power before the Persians came around. How could the Greeks say that a tiny city built on a distant crag could be mightier than Nineveh? The answer, of course, from Facilities would be, Nineveh is not free. The Greeks are. We hope to see you over in the summer seminar. Uh, open for questions right now if you'd like to hear them. Thank you.